Hi, we are excited to be talking to you today about establishing presence in online courses. I'm Jennifer Quinlan from Brigham Young University. I work as an academic product consultant, uh, helping faculty develop blended and online courses on campus. For the last decade or so, I've been teaching and um, working as an instructional designer, building those online courses. So we're, I'm excited to talk to you today with Laura. My name is Laura Hanley. I teach German at the high school level. Uh, through Appalachia Intermediate Unit 8, which is based out of Pennsylvania. I've been working online since 2011 uh, for various companies. And I am also very thrilled to be talking to you about establishing presence. So let's start with our objectives. By the end of this module, you will be able to identify three forms of presence, describe tools and resources for each form of presence, and explore best practices of asynchronous and synchronous interactions. We're going to start with the definition of presence. So what is this that we're talking about? Presence is defined as the fact or condition of being involved, the bearing, carriage, or air of a person, or a noteworthy quality of poise and effectiveness. And all of these things are things that we want to focus on as teachers and bring to our classroom, be it a brick and mortar school or online. We also need to define the two different kinds of interactions that occur in the online classroom. We have synchronous and asynchronous activities. Synchronous events are events where everyone is participating at the same time, for example, a webinar or a class. They create notable opportunities to establish and strengthen your presence because you are there in front of the students. Asynchronous events are events where student participation is not simultaneous. Discussion threads, wiki posts. They can also create opportunities for you to establish your presence even though you are not participating at the same time as the students. Some examples of synchronous activities are a digital lab, a world-class ex expert coming to present, an interactive streamed event, a simulation, or a live demonstration. You might use these events to facilitate student group work. You can also do presentations in a synchronous setting, or you can introduce a cohort. Attendance is usually through video conferencing. However, if you are in a situation in which you also incorporate face-to-face -face meetings, uh, those are also synchronous activities. We need to make sure that our synchronous activities have a high learning value. Why are we using the synchronous activities to do whatever it is that we're doing instead of independent work? The students need to be engaged and understand why they are scheduling their time to come to a synchronous activity. Our other choice for activities are asynchronous. These are usually in the form of discussion boards or other postings. They can meet a range of learning objectives. We can use discussion boards to encourage demonstration of knowledge of key concepts, community building, reflection, consensus building, and critical thinking. You can also ask students to build a discussion board early on in the semester and revisit it as they go through the lessons and learn more about the topic and can add to their posts and their class knowledge in those boards. One of the other positives of having synchronous and asynchronous activities in your online classroom is that you can provide, especially at the high school level, information to students they would not have other, otherwise have access to. Uh, for example, the students that I work with, none of them go to a school, a public school that has a German teacher. So if I were not teaching to them online, they would not have the opportunity to experience German. Um, and the, the company also provides other languages, Chinese, French, Spanish. So these students are exposed to culture that they never would have otherwise seen in their high school careers through these online classrooms which I think is one of the most important things that we can do as online teachers. Yeah, I think that's really spot on. When we think about the affordances that we offer students through online education, um, it can be surprising how vast and how deep that can run. So let's talk a little bit about establishing presence in our online course. Uh, 
we're going to talk about three main types of presence, social, teaching, and cognitive. So first of all, think about what your classroom presence is. You're probably in front of your students every day or multiple times a week. Um, you have interactions with them, you develop a rapport, you start to understand their learning style maybe a little bit, and they start to understand your style of teaching and what to expect from you. So as you think about that, why would your online class be any different? Let's dig into each one of these. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about social presence. Much like in the classroom, creating a social presence takes some time. While you have face-to-face -face interactions every day in class, you may not have as many uh, direct interactions with your students in an online course. So to create social presence, think about some key elements. Start your course out with introductions. It's important for students to get to know each other. Here um, on the right, you can see an example of um, a ninth grade English course. So in the welcome module, you can see the course intro, the syllabus, the course policies, the instructor intro, contact info. You'll also see on the right that there are scheduled required video conferences and some pertinent information on that. Setting up times to meet in person, um, making yourself available to students, and designing interaction that will happen between you and your students as well as between the students themselves. These can all help create social presence. Now one note on that, um, if you determine to have students reach you via text or phone calls. Um, probably not a good idea to give out your personal number, so create a Google phone number or something like that so there's um, kind of a buffer of safety there. To foster social presence, there are some behaviors that um, we want to talk about. Be willing to talk about what you think is important and why. Be respectful, provide thoughtful responses to students, just like you would in the classroom, right? Engage with students um, through dialogue and through tools that they know. Also, you probably need to consider the tools that your institution has licenses for um, or tools that are free, right? Also think about, um, for example, um, social media opportunities. So you might create a private YouTube channel or a private Facebook channel, and these can be great resources um, to create some social interaction as well. This next slide gives you an example of a French course. So you can see there are some social elements that are actually built into the course design. You can see a course wiki up there in the table of contents, a discussion board. You can see a communication and conversation cafe. So clearly the person who designed this course wanted to specifically and overtly design social presence into the course. Uh, ultimately, we want to keep in mind that sometimes students do feel isolated and alone in their online courses. So that social presence and creating a way for them to have interaction are important factors to their success. You can see it, this particular thread, a student had commented, nervous for my speak for speaking appointment. The instructor has replied there with helpful tips and below that is a reply from another student talking about how the first speaking appointment went for them. So you can see how that social presence can become a great support for a student. The LMS can help um, with social presence, as I showed in some of these examples. It can also help in establishing your teaching presence. Down here uh, in the lower right-hand corner, you see a Canvas dashboard. You can see tools like the course announcements, calendar, the email, inbox, class notebook, syllabus, upcoming assignments. So there are a lot of tools built into many LMSs or learning management systems that facilitate establishing your teaching presence. You can also consider external tools like Turnitin, which is a plagiarism helper, VoiceThread, you can see that pictured in the top right. Um, these are all ways that can help facilitate your teaching presence even asynchronously. So you don't have to have a live interaction with your students every time you interact, but you can have meaningful instructional interactions. Make sure that expectations are clear and you follow through with them just like you would in your face-to-face, -face, right? How will students be present and how will you be present? Also let them know how long they can expect for things like replies to email, grading timeframes, what your office hours are, and so forth. When it comes to grading, 
provide consistent and meaningful feedback on the assignments throughout the course. In fact, you may find that you provide deeper feedback or more extensive feedback in the online course because you don't have the same face-to-face -face interaction that you might have in a classroom. Um, encourage your students to ask you questions and to engage in deeper conversation with you. Remind them about upcoming things, assignments that are due, scheduled events, etc. Provide encouragement to them, just like you would in your face-to-face -face class. Are you starting to see some similarities here? Um, one other thing to note is a group interaction in your online course is not the place to point out unique student issues. Keep those discussions um, for the appropriate form. So confidential matters, make sure that you respect and keep confidential and one-on-one -on -one whenever that's appropriate. Now let's talk a little bit about cognitive presence. The key tool in your cognitive presence is having a well-organized, predictable, and tightly aligned course. And by aligned, I mean learning objectives are stated and the content, practice activities, and assessments all align to those objectives. Use other tools like visual cognition to help students remember what they've learned. Um, providing lots of good content isn't enough for a good course. Cognitively, students need to engage in inquiry, probing, putting their language to use. So as an instructor, examine your student responses and probe for more. Question the learner, push them to think further than just memorizing their vocabulary and conjugation. As you would in the classroom, encourage thought and analysis of ideas and applying their language in challenging ways. Um, I really like this quote from Judith Betcher, Cognitive presence requires a focus on meaning. This may mean that depth and problem solving is favored over concept awareness and covering content. It requires time, listening, reflecting, and careful responding to encourage sustained conversation. And who doesn't want to have sustained conversation in their language classroom, right? So let's just sum up a few kind of best practices um, as you think about your presence. Set the clear expectations in your syllabus and in your course orientation. Consider the aspects of both the asynchronous and synchronous interactions that you'll have and your expectations for both, what the students can expect from you, what you will expect from them, and be detailed about that. You might have rubrics and um, detailed instructions, really good course design that's gonna foster um, an overall presence that's valuable for your students and that creates a meaningful uh, learning experience for them. When you think about your synchronous events, plan ahead. Get everything loaded up ahead of time. All your digital content should be loaded up and do a test run before you have your live students join. You're always going to have tech fails. You know, it happens. And so have a backup plan and also create that expectation with your students. Hey, sometimes the internet goes down. If that happens, here's what we do. Um, as you would in class, provide learning takeaways. So in an online forum, that's probably not going to be handouts on paper, but those might be digital handouts, links to media supports, um, and other things like that. We also want to allow students to, uh, you know, as you establish this presence, you want students to be able to engage in natural discussion. And so the discussion threads might not always stay totally on point or go exactly the direction you think they would go, um, but that's okay. Let discussions evolve naturally, but make sure that you are there and moderating as needed. Correct misconceptions or errors in their language learning. Redirect the conversation if it starts to get so far off topic or if it starts to get inappropriate, redirect and bring it back to the focus. Um, another great practice with your live online interactions is to record those. These can be a really powerful instructional tool. I've posted a picture here of an example. On the right is one of our students who took Korean 101 online. Now she happens to be a faculty at another university. I think she was a psychology faculty. She's of Korean descent. Her parents are both native Korean, but she never learned to speak Korean. And she took this course to try to just learn Korean. Well, we record all of our one-on-one -on -one 
interactions with the students. And here on the left is pictured the TA who was supporting her in a low stakes oral evaluation. So the TA was talking about the students' goals and then they had a, a low stakes oral assessment. This was in lesson one of the course. In lesson six, the TA played this recording for the student and asked the student to evaluate herself. As she was watching this recording, she was just shocked. Like her identity as a Korean speaker changed. She realized, I have Korean skills. I can speak Korean. And it changed her confidence and her engagement with the language. So those recorded interactions can become very powerful teaching tools and enhancements as you move forward in the course. So here to conclude, we have some examples of things that you can do or that you can look at to enhance your knowledge of how to create presence. Of course, using an orientation video and an instructor introduction in every one of your courses, whether they are mostly synchronous, mostly asynchronous, or a combination of both. Uh, netiquette guidelines are really important in any course. The expectations for your students when they're participating online may not have been the same in the other courses that they came to you from. So giving them your expectations uh, and the good expectations that you have for them is also very important. Using discussion boards to check understanding of key concepts, building community through icebreakers on discussion boards. Then of course the webinars and the live lesson presentations. Uh, reflection posts that you can do in journals where students are reflecting on what they've been doing in the synchronous and asynchronous sessions. You can do presentations, either live synchronously, or you can do them asynchronously where students post their presentations on YouTube or another video hosting site, and their peers can then provide feedback to those, uh, either in the target language or in English, depending on what level you're working with. You can also do group work, schedule small group meetings online or in person, depending on your situation, to help students get to know you, get to know each other, work on projects. Always provide rubrics if possible to show students how they will be graded on their discussion boards on their assignments. It gives them a stake, a higher stake in what they're doing and they know exactly what your expectations are. You can also do some really cool things because you are teaching online. You can go on virtual field trips. You can go basically anywhere in the world on the internet, which you cannot do in a brick and mortar classroom. Uh, so using that to your advantage is, is very, cool for the students, especially if they've never been outside of their very small towns. You can do web quests. They can bring information back to the class from those web quests, uh, teach each other, and you can do other interactive elements facilit facilitated by you, the instructor. Some additional resources, and you will have links for all of these things uh, in the Dig Deeper section of this module. Creating instructor presence. This article talks about announcements and messages and how to use them. There's also a video to you to make yourself more accessible to the students. This technology that improves instructor presence in online courses gives you tools for creating student community in your courses. Then next to the amazing impact of your online presence and teaching digital citizenship, talk about the general ideas of online presence. You should definitely consider what other information about you that students and their parents can find on the web. If they Google you, what will they find? Can they find your Facebook? Are your pictures set to private? Are your posts set to private? Are you on other websites for maybe something that you've done that's been in the news or anything else that you've done that has ended up on the internet because the internet has a lot of things and you need to think about how you are being perceived by your students outside of the classroom as well. Teaching di digital citizenship shows that the example that you set is one that the, your students will follow. If you are laid back about how you handle your classroom, your students will be laid back in class. If you give them firm expectations and tell them what it is that they need to do and what it is that you are doing to make the course the best that it can be, then they will fulfill those expectations. Teaching with Technology gives you a lot of different articles on online teaching as a whole, creating presence, 
how to write discussion boards, how to create wikis, how to do all kinds of different things. So that will may be helpful to you in the whole, on the whole, in this mentoring program. So to sum up what we've learned here is how to identify our three forms of presence, describing tools and resources for each form of presence, and exploring best practices of asynchronous and synchronous interactions with our students. The Dig Deeper section of this module will provide additional resources and insights into the best practices on online learning. Please remember that you can always reach out to your mentor and to our small interest group community for additional support and ideas. We come from all different educational backgrounds. We teach for all kinds of different schools and universities. So if you're looking for something specific, we can probably provide it. And if not, we can point you in the direction of someone who can. Thank you very much for listening to us today and make sure to direct any questions to your mentor.